Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Lacolian Washington, who serves as executive director of the Community Music Center of Boston. Lacolian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. It's nice to see you again. I'm really uh, honored to be able to have some time with you today. Well, and I, of course, have to share with our audience, I am extra excited to be able to talk with Lacolian. I have had the deep and distinct honor of being able to see his work up front uh, and personal over literally decades. And he's been a longtime member of the Sphinx Symphony and many things associated uh, with the work that, that have been able to do over the years. So I am just truly honored to be able to have you on the show and for the audience to be able to hear some of your insights on the field. So it's great yeah. that here. Thank you so much. Again, you again, like as you said, longtime friend. I'm really glad we get a chance to chat. And you have been someone who I have watched over the years and watched your career. So I'm excited to uh, to talk with you again today. Awesome. 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 So first, I thought it would be great for our audience, the Community Music Center of Boston. If you could kind of give us just the quick overview, the breadth of the work uh, and the scope of the work that that is uh, taking place there. It's an extraordinary institution, but some of our audience may not know. And of course, also as creative partner for Arts Engines and uh, and has been able to kind of help us to think about, you know, what the focus and how we want to talk about some of these issues for the show. So if you could share that kind of overview, that would be great. So sure. Uh, community Music Center of Boston is one of the oldest and largest community music schools in the country. We were founded in 1910, um, and it was a charter member of the National Guild for Community Arts Education. Um, its role in Boston is not only are we a community music school, but we're also the largest outside provider of arts education in the Boston public schools. We work with around 3,000, between 2,500 and 3,000 students in BPS every week. Uh, and we were also one of the early adopters of music therapy. We've been doing music therapy work since the 70s, and we still today work with health and human health and human services partners around the city, uh, working with individuals with physical and cognitive disabilities, um, and providing uh, music therapy music therapy services. Uh, so we do uh, it's quite a broad cross section of of work around the city. But those are our three main buckets: our community music school, our um, our school program as well as our music therapy program. So that is, it's absolutely awesome. And, and obviously we have a, a number of different, you know, community music schools around the country, but the history and the breadth of what you do is obviously truly impactful and unique. Um, and I thought especially, could you kind of share a little bit more, because I'm sure there are some in our audience who are doing some of the components relating to the public schools, the community music school, but the music therapy, a lot of people are, you know, kind of uh, getting more into this work, seeing its impact. And just wondering if you could describe for, for everyone kind of how does that manifest? What, what is the experience like and or the structure of the program? Yeah, so music therapy, that is um, you are using music as a tool to uh, to to achieve a non-musical goal. Uh, so, for example, if you have someone who may have a communication challenge, you may work with them uh, to communicate via music. You would tap on a drum, they would tap on a drum, and it's a way of creating a social connection. Also, if someone has a physical challenge, you might then have them engage in music, um, but it's specifically to work on some type of a musical... Some type of excuse me physical challenge that they may have in their body and we employ board board certified music therapists so for those of us who are performing musicians those of us who are teachers we're like well i do music therapy all the time uh we actually don't <laughs> because we are not board certified music therapists so there isn't an, an entire field of study around being a board certified music therapist that allows you to be able to work alongside a, clin a clinician or a primary caregiver to uh, as part of someone's therapeutic work and therapeutic practice so it's a little bit different than the thing that we do every week when we're teaching our lessons. That is such an important point because I know there have been some programs 
where people are like, oh yeah, I'll just do music therapy and so on and so on. And I'm like, uh, you know, there's actually an association, certified music therapists. They, this is a profession and requires training uh, and, uh, and, and expertise that doesn't just come from being a musician. And so I think that is just so key in the model of the way in which you're doing that and incorporating into the, the community music school, I think is, is, is extraordinary. And obviously that impact on young people is, is amazing. Um, and so that is great work that you're doing. Um, so I want to kind of just switch gears a little bit because there is certainly, uh, you know, this kind of age old thing in the field of, especially for performers of, you know, should I become an administrator or not? And there's sometimes fear associated with that and, or a sense of, of almost well regret, like, well, I've spent my whole life building my profession on the instrument and now I'll go to administrating, but what about that? Or I wanna do both, how do I balance it? Um, so I've accumulated about eight different questions um, all wrapped up in, but what I think uh, many in our audience experience, which is wrestling with the balance and incorporation of performing and or evolving into or balancing with administrating in our field. And you have basically been at the level of excellence in both. Uh, and so just wondering if you could kind of share anything about your story, that transition and or how you balance it in a way that clearly is successful and is having impact on both sides. Well, I think uh, I mean I think I'm still working on trying to figure out how to mentally balance it. I think as a performing musician, that's such a piece of your identity as a person. It's it it was my my first. I guess when I moved to Boston, uh, it was the first place that I showed up where people didn't know that I played the bassoon. Um, because I was here, the executive director of the Community Music Center of Boston. And so I had to introduce myself and say, I play the bassoon. People were like, oh, okay. Uh, or people would ask me, are you a musician? Whereas typically I was always attached to being a bassoonist. And so that was, just from an identity perspective, was actually a little bit of a challenge for me. Um, I have, uh, I've gotten past that part, but I think that the thing going back to when I was teaching at the universities um, and when I was performing quite a bit, I was always thinking about um, other things that were outside of performance. I always felt like the my artistic practice uh, didn't exist in a vacuum and didn't exist for itself. For me, it was a vehicle for me to be able to engage with other people. It was it was actually quite common that my um, my artistic practice was connected to some version of teaching. So I would do a residency at a conservatory. I'd do a recital, but I'd also do a master class. And so I was always existing inside these uh, multiple identities. Um, and that was really helpful in the uh, the transition into my current role where I am, I'm the, I'm the CEO, I'm the executive director. And so everyone really only knows me in this one space. But I will say one final thing to that. I always, felt like I wanted to have two careers anyway. Um, I told myself when I was in my 20s that I would look, I, when I turned 40, I would look what I look at what I was doing when I was 40 and if, determine whether or not I want to be doing that when I'm 50. And if I don't, I would start uh, transitioning into my second career. Uh, what I found was in my late 30s, I started to recognize that uh, not only was I interested in uh, doing things that allowed me to use the strategic uh, part of my brain, um, but I was it, I was actually excited about that. Um, and as my performance career got to a certain point, um, I was almost more excited about doing these other things, engaging with young people, uh, leading staffs, doing strategic planning, acting as a consultant. I was more excited about that than I was about playing my interest. So the transition for me actually seemed um, quite, uh, quite easy because I had done what I wanted to do at a certain point, I felt like if I could stay, if I stayed in per performance career, it would be a lot of rewrapping of the same present. Um, and this new career was a whole different suite of things um, and whole different uh, set of skill sets uh, that I could play around in and also develop. And so it was, it was actually a pretty easy transition for me because of the way that I viewed my career and how I thought about my own sense of my impact on the community. Awesome. Awesome. No, it's amazing. And it's an amazing journey uh, that you've taken. And one additional thing that I'm curious with that too, is in addition to the performing, 
you also really have been an entrepreneur and kind of creating things and co-founding, especially in the chamber music space and um, and creating festival. And, and, and so I'm curious, did those skill sets that you needed to employ there, do you find yourself using those in an administrative uh, leadership of, of an organization that you didn't create but took the reins of that's been around for so long? But are those skill sets employable in this role as well? Absolutely. And actually, you know, it's funny you should mention those things. Um, it, that has actually led to an important program that we have here at the Community Music Center of Boston. We have a youth employment program where we're trying to give young people an opportunity to learn inside an arts organization how to uh, how to work inside an arts organization. So later on in their careers, if they want to start something or if they want to um, if they want to work in an arts organization, they can. Because for me, I went to bassoon school. I knew how to play the bassoon really well. Um, but when I got into this part, it was like, okay, now you've got to come up with a concert program. You've got to figure out how to market this thing. These were all skills that I had to develop over over time. Um, and uh, I was glad and lucky that I had a mind around. Um, being able to soak in information and then um, uh, activate that information in service of something. So the the Prism International Chamber Music Festival that started in Memphis, Tennessee, when that started, uh, I had just come from a big international festival in South Africa uh, in Stellenbosch. And I was like, wow, this is so amazing. They can do this here. I bet I could do something like it in Memphis. And I just said, I'm going to do the thing. And the first year, I learned, I learned a lot uh, and I struggled a lot, but over time that became this thing. And if you have a certain, uh, certain quality instincts, I think, and I, you will know this as well as anyone, Aaron, if you have certain instincts, um, sometimes those instincts can drive you towards what I would call backing into the answer. So you didn't know the answer on this side. <laughs> you just kept plugging away <laughs> and then you backed into the answer. You're like, Oh, this is what all that was. That's wonderful. Right. Um, and I think that was, um, but that was, a, that was what I learned back then. But I do think that I was a, a serious learner. I read a lot. I read about things like leadership and, and strategic planning. These are things I was reading about. Um, so those things, as they were moving around in my brain, I really felt comfortable being able to, to activate those things in the work that I was doing. But you, I'm sure you'll know this as well, as much as you work as an entrepreneur, many of those things are, there's just a lot of luck in there too. Um, because it's not, I wish I could say that it was all me, but it wasn't. There was a lot of, a lot of support from a lot of people around. Um, and there was also a lot of luck in there too. There were a lot of people who volunteered their time. There were a lot of people who supported an organization that they didn't know anything about, but they would give, you know, for us four and five figure gifts and which was big for us back then. And so, you know, again, it was, it was, um, Although you have a skill set, you also really need to have the stars align in your favor as well. Totally. No, it really is. And it's amazing work. And of course, I'm hearing so many of these themes that drive entrepreneurship work ethic. It was great how you mentioned about, you know, luck, serendipity, collaboration, um, innovation, you know, all of intellectual curiosity. You just exemplify all of these, all of these areas. So unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask of all of my guests, this work, while it's amazing and you've accomplished so much and, and created so much impact, there's got to be tough days and days where it seems like, man, it could potentially be overwhelming. And just curious for you, are there any mechanisms or things that you turn to for inspiration or for strength or for guidance during those really toughest of days of leadership? There's a couple of things. Um, I will say the the tough days, one thing I turn to is going to the sauna. I love being in the sauna. Um, but I think the other thing is um, my, I have two sons. Uh, one's a high school senior. The other one is a sophomore. Hanging out with them is super fun. They they put the other things into perspective. Um, and that perspective is really helpful, um, helpful for me uh, to recognize that that my I have people who love me and care about me and they don't know anything about what I do. 
Um, they know a little bit, but that's not why they love me. And so it's a reminder for me in that one. Um, and then I think the last thing, I just recently came back from a retreat, a black men's healing retreat. Um, and it was really, really powerful for me. And so I'm going to continue to try to find various ways for me to engage in self-care um, because I do, I'm now recognizing, especially at this point in my career, uh, that self-care is an important thing. So I'm glad you're asking that question of everyone, um, but it's, it's friends, family, and just taking si taking time to focus on myself. That is, it's so awesome. And I suppose for strength, you might turn to, it looks like Muhammad Ali behind you on the wall <laughs> there. So that, that also might be the case. Lacoli in Washington, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for everything you do. And thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate you. Thank you.